And we are back, and uh, I am going to be tackling the uh, Battles of the American Revolution series, designed by Mark Miklos. Uh, this is the Tri-Pack. This came out in 2017. Massive three-inch box. Comes with three, the first three games in this series, uh, two of which I believe had been out of print for a while. I think Guilford and Brandywine had been out of print since they came out in like the late 90s or early 2000s. Saratoga had gotten a second edition um, at some point, and that sort of upgraded the components, came with a mounted map, and then GMT decided that they were going to uh, package the first three games rather than reprint individual ones into one big box. Um, I'm a big fan of them doing this. They did this with the Men of Iron series as well, um, and uh, it's just a great way to get into a system because it gives you so much content uh, in the box. Brandywine um, and Saratoga are uh, single games. Guilford um, is a game that actually has two battles in it, Battle of Guilford Courthouse and then Utah Springs, which as you can see is what we're going to be playing here. <clears throat> this is a small battle, sort of smaller than something like Saratoga or Brandywine. And what's nice about these is that they actually give um, kind of multiple scenarios. So for example, with Utah Springs, we're gonna be playing the, the quote unquote game scenario, um, but there is a historical scenario as well if you prefer to have it a little more unbalanced. But um, typically these are designed to give both players a good time, even if they're not ex exactly order of battle um, accurate or positionally accurate. Um, I have played um, Saratoga once before, many years ago. I soloed it and then played it head-to-head -head, uh, with someone, and I enjoyed it um, a bit. Well, I enjoyed it. Um, I won't say a bit. I enjoyed it, um, but I can't remember most of uh, <laughs> the rules, so um, I have decided that, uh, and I haven't played this since I got it, so I was like, you know, I'm going to pull this off the shelf. It's a good system for soloing, um, and... Uh, you know, get back into it because I have all this content here and I've never played it and I think it would be fun. The American Revolution is of great interest to me. Um, I just, I love 18th century uh, warfare. It's such an interesting period. Um, and obviously the American Revolution is always relevant to someone who lives in America, um, especially with some of these battles, which I, you know, Saratoga and Brandywine are pretty um, well known. Guilford less so. Utah Springs, completely new to me. Um, I was reading up on it. Uh, this is late in the war. This is 1781. Um, so, um, with that all said, um, I do want to also mention that um, playing solo, so there's one element to this game that uh, is tough to solo, and that is the fact that the game uses um, sort of maneuver, uh, a sort of hidden maneuver um, choice when you're in close combat, um, where both sides choose a maneuver, and then based on the combination, a matrix of things, actually I can show you, uh, based on a matrix of what maneuver the attacker and the defender choose, there's sort of a DRM for the combat role. Now, obviously, playing this solo, you know, as the attacker and defender, you'll know what each other's doing, so you get into this endless, like, loop of, like, oh, okay, uh, you know, what am I going to choose to get the advantage? So, enter... C3i Magazine number 33, and the wonderful Joel Toppin, who has a great YouTube channel and uh, also does a lot of stuff for GMT, works on Vassal modules. Um, he's great. He created uh, this system um, that came in C3i number 33 that allows you to solo the game um, by giving you tables for each of the different maneuvers and situations that, uh, you know, a, a same, uh, the other faction that's controlled by the same player might get into. Um, and so it kind of randomizes the... Um, the, the formation that you choose and will affect the die roll. And so that could lead to some cool emergent uh, stories that come out of it. Um, this is the chart that we'll be using. Um, now, I do need to, uh, before we begin, I'm going to check out the rules about how this is used. But basically, you'll roll a die um, based on the situation. And then based on what you roll, that'll be the formation that the, um, uh, the uh, I, I presume the defender or maybe the attacker will use um, in the combat. And that will determine on that matrix I showed you what the DRM will be for that. So this is a really cool addition. I'm really glad I actually picked up C3i 33. I didn't actually know this was in there until a couple days ago when I was going through my C3i's and just organizing all this counters and stuff that came in them. Uh, but if you play Battles of the American Revolution, uh, this in solo, this is probably a really great um, thing to pick up. And I believe you can still get issue number 33. It didn't come out that long ago. It came out in 2019. So we will be using that. Okay, Utah Springs. Uh, so what are we talking about here? Well, Utah Springs, 1781. This is Nathaniel Green, his campaigns in the South, specifically South Carolina. This is a 10-turn game, or up to 10 turns. Um, and this system is characterized by um, its playability. The rules are pretty short and simple. Um, a lot of just block and tackle war game concepts here. Zones of control, movement points, hex encounter, all of that stuff. Um, you've got army morale tracks here, and the army morale, um, if it ever gets to zero, you lose. Um, but the army morale has an effect on uh, turn initiative. So when you roll at the beginning of the turn to see who goes first, if you have lower army morale... Um, then you have less of a chance of going first. And uh, this army morale will go up and down based on combat results that you, uh, when you're fighting or when units get destroyed or eliminated. 
and possibly when leaders get killed. Um, and so this will kind of shift back and forth, mostly down, sometimes it'll go up um, for each side. And ideally one of the things is you wanna keep your army morale high because units also have morale. As you can see here, this British foraging party has this negative one number. That little number is the unit's morale. And constant, in this game, frequently, you're gonna have uh, units in combat take morale checks where you'll roll after a combat to see whether or not they retreat or stand. And so high number is good, low number is bad, negative really bad. Um, and so uh, this combined with the army morale will affect a lot of uh, situations in the game. And so you get like an overall picture of your forces sort of uh, willingness to fight as the battle sort of progresses. Each turn is, a, is an hour, um, so uh, we're starting at 7 a.m. and going to 4 p.m. or sooner. Uh, you know, last game ended really early, could happen here. But what you're looking at here is um, sort of a part of South Carolina, northwest of Charleston. And you've got the Santee Swamp, you've got the Santee River, and you've got uh, a British encampment here at this uh, plantation house, I believe. It is the, uh, the one Toot Plantation, I believe is what it's called. And uh, the British here are encamped um, in sort of the yard out front. Um, the Americans, you'll notice there's no Americans on the board. The Americans uh, are going to come in. They get reinforcements every turn, and they will be entering um, either here or up here on these roads. And uh, their basic mission is to take control of the British camp. You can see that there's some tents here. There's actually uh, spaces that have tents under some of these units. But basically, the, um, the, the Americans want to control more than 50% of these camp hexes. That gives them bonus points at the end of the game. They can also win outright if they, uh, I believe, if they eliminate a certain number of, um, of uh, British regulars and or uh, Tory uh, uh, provincial units. Um, and they have to do that uh, while also uh, occupying Hex 1108, which is right here. So you can see blue star. That's the key objective. Take that, kill or capture British, win the game. For the British, it's going to be um, similar. Um, if they can eliminate General Green, which obviously, as we know historically, did not happen, um, and also uh, capture a uh, certain number of strength points of American units. Now, uh, that victory condition for both sides seems a little challenging because there's not a ton of units here, and that's why I'm playing this scenario uh, in particular is because I'm refreshing the rules, wanting to play something smaller, something a little snappier, something not so complex like Fornova 1495, um, and this felt like a good starting point. So even though we're at the end of the Revolutionary War, I still think there's some value um, in, in checking this out. And if I like this, I may go and do Guilford Courthouse after this, which is another smaller scenario um, that took place about six months prior, uh, five or six months prior to this historically. All right, so strategic consideration. So first of all, um, the British here, um, they have sent out this foraging party. This foraging party cannot move until he is attacked. And based on what happens when he gets attacked, that will determine who has the initiative in turn number three. Historically, members of this foraging party were able to retreat back to the, uh, um, the camp and warn the British that the Americans were coming. Um, the Americans, for their part, mostly made up of Continentals, but you do have um, some militia under here. You've got some state units from, uh, I believe, South Carolina. You've also got the Swamp Fox uh, Marion himself. He's got some special abilities um, and he's got some militia under him. He comes in either turn two or turn three. It's up to the American player's choice. Uh, the British, they are mostly composed of regulars and some, like I said, provincial units. There's also some militia, I believe some rifle militia under there um, as well. These are your leaders right here. They provide DRMs in combat. They help rally troops um, who may be disordered from battle. And I will show you how combat works. It's pretty simple. There's also artillery in this game, which weirdly, um, and I'll come back to this in my final thoughts, you can only use defensively in this game, which is kind of strange, um, but I kind of get it. Um, beautiful map, uh, beautiful artwork. Uh, this one, sort of a lightly forested open area, some rivers here. I think the British are probably, you know, historically they anchored their flank up against um, the swamps of the river and, and this uh, blackjack oak uh, grove here. Um, and then these uh, hexes here, so in terms of what the British want to do, these hexes here, if the Americans ever control uh, four of the seven, I believe there's seven, yep, um, their British army morale goes down by one. So there's an incentive here for the British to kind of get up forward of this position um, once they are allowed to move starting on turn three and uh, take it, make a defensive line here that the Americans will have to uh, bust through to maintain their army morale. The Americans, for their part, most of their units are going to come in here along this road, but some are going to come in down here, so the British will have to be careful about their right flank and figure out how they're going to defend against that. This river line with these uh, ridges, obviously, is going to be helpful. Or I guess it's a stream, a creek, if you will. Um, and that's basically it. So nice and simple, a nice little small engagement. Um, 
And uh, you can see that, like I said, with the units, um, you've got your morale, you've got your combat factor, and you've got your movement value. And it's pretty much there's a terrain effects chart, and it costs a certain amount of movement points to move across the terrain. So um, I think that's mostly it. Um, I'll explain some other stuff as we go. There's a, you know, if the Americans actually do take some of these camp hexes, they have to roll to see if they stop and start looting them, um, which can disorder them. So obviously the Americans want to take those, but they, you know, risk set, set them, setting themselves up to be uh, fired upon and counterattacked. So uh, it should be pretty fun, and um, you know we're gonna get underway, and I'll sort of uh, like hopefully shepherd you through the uh, the narrative that emerges. All right, well we're flying along real quick here. Uh, we have been playing for less than uh, two minutes, three, two or three minutes, and uh, we're already on turn two. <clears throat> now that's primarily because the Americans are the only ones who get to do anything on the first two turns, but and they also don't have a lot of units, so it's pretty easy. They come in on the road, they march down the road. They come into contact with this British foraging party who was out early in the morning looking for sweet potatoes to feed the troops. Uh, and suddenly, before you know it, surrounded by cavalry, you've got Light Horse Harry Lee's uh, sort of cavalry scouts and his uh, foot uh, musket men here, his light infantry unit. You've also got some uh, South Carolina uh, state units, these horsemen, and uh, some reinforcements coming up from behind. There's a Continental Artillery group under there, plus some other stuff. But the important thing we care about here <clears throat> is this combat. It's the first combat of the game. It's almost scripted to be that way. Well, it is scripted to be that way. Um, so this foraging party, depending on what happens to this foraging party, um, <clears throat> uh, that will determine who gets initiative on the next turn, and that's when the British can start um, acting uh, in their camp and whether or not they'll be alerted to the approaching American troops. So I just want to take you through a combat here real quick and um, and show you actually the solo uh, tactic selection uh, system as well. Now I've decided that uh, I am, you know, in order not to subconsciously bias myself towards the Americans, <clears throat> as you would expect, uh, sometimes I think when you're playing solo war games, especially Hex Encounter, it's really easy to get into the mindset of one side or the other and kind of half-ass it for the uh, for you know the other side, which I try not to do. But this uh, this solo system takes it out of my hands because I've decided I'm going to use the solo um, uh, solo uh, tactics um, chart from C3I for both sides. So I'm actually not going to have control over that. I'm only going to really have control over the positioning, the, uh, who do I'm attacking. But then when it comes to the actual battle, the troops are going to kind of uh, by die roll <clears throat> decide what they do. Um, this one's going to be pretty easy. So we're looking at a combat sequence here. We determine the odds ratio. Uh, it's pretty easy. This, All of these units are attacking the foraging party, and they have to because they're all adjacent to it. In this game, you have to attack everyone you're adjacent to. Positioning, obviously, very important. You've got the two cavalry units. You've got this uh, uh, Lee's Legion foot units here, this light infantry there are one, and then you've got some South Carolina um, <clears throat> musket men as well down here. Um, all told, that's three, four, five. We are on the five to one ratio, which is pretty big. Um, in fact, that's off the off the table. Uh, it's going to be a four to one attack because um, there is no five to one. <clears throat> Uh, then we determine the lead units. I'm going to determine that this light uh, unit here is the lead unit, and the reason I'm doing that is for its plus one morale. That's very good. Obviously, the foraging party um, is its own lead unit with a minus one. Not great. <clears throat> um, and so we look at the DRMs on the combat table just to see what we're going to get here. And um, so the terrain is not going to make a, a difference. We're we're in some crops, some some farmland there. Uh, that's not going to do do much. And as for the combat itself, so the attacker is going to get plus one for morale. Uh, there's no leader. Um, all defending units are militia, attacked by at least one non-militia unit. I believe that is true. So uh, that's another plus one for the attacker. Defender is surrounded. Yes, the defender is surrounded. He's got zones of control all around him and or units. So that's another plus one. So we're up to plus three. Uh, the defender has a minus one morale, which is going to give us actually another DRM in our favor, so plus four for the attacker. Um, attacker is surrounded, yes, so we're up to plus five. So uh, plus five for uh, a, a plus five uh, for the uh, Americans here, which is uh, really good. Uh, that is definitely, definitely what they want. Now, <clears throat> um, at this point, we go to uh, the tactics, and this is where we use this chart. So um, it, it's pretty easy. There's eight, basically 10 different possible scenarios, eight of which involve a leader being involved in the battle, um, and then two of which uh, have no leader. So in this combat, there is no leader, so it's going to be pretty simple. Um, so both sides are going to roll on this table. Um, engaging without a leader, withdraw plausible. Well, yeah, that's definitely the foraging party. They would want to withdraw from this post-haste. Um, so they're going to roll um, on this with a D8, 
and they get minus one because the odds are three to one to determine which tactics they choose. They rolled a two, minus one is a one, so they are rolling to withdraw. And then this one, engage without a leader, withdraw not plausible, obviously the Americans don't want to withdraw. They <clears throat> are going to roll, and they're gonna roll the plus one because they're attacking at greater than three to one odds. And they rolled a three after the modifier. So that is gonna be, here I'll mark these so we can see what we're doing here. Stand fast versus a withdraw. And if we flip this, uh, if we or if we look at this matrix right here, the defender chose withdraw, and stand fast uh, was the attacker. And actually, that combination of things results in no combat. So, <clears throat> in this particular instance, there is no combat, despite the Americans wanting to um, shut down this foraging party. We get a no combat result. So the foraging party uh, managed to spot at the last moment the uh, Patriot troops coming up the road and the horses uh, come skirting the outside of this farmland and was able to um, essentially fall back out of the combat. Now, unfortunately for the foraging party, the zones of control of these rapidly moving horse... Um, so when you get a no combat, if you're the defender, you just have to retreat one hex. However, there are zones of control here, so the, um, the foraging party, who is trying to fall back from this, actually cannot retreat. If any hex that they would retreat to uh, is a zone of control of an enemy. And in this game, you are specified which direction you can retreat to. In this, in this game and scenario, the British can only retreat to the northeast, the east, or the southeast. And that means that instead of retreating, this foraging party is actually captured and put in the captured units box. So... The upshot of all of that is that the uh, Patriots managed to successfully surprise and surround the British foraging party. And uh, because of that, are going to have initiative on the next turn, which is going to push them closer to the, the British camp out here. And the British have no idea that they're coming. So uh, one quick clarification on this situation here um, that I, we've already resolved and I'm probably not going to go back and fix, but um, there's some uh, extra language that the designer has talked about in this particular game with this particular situation because there's a little bit of vagary in the way that the rules language is laid out. Um, so a couple things. First of all, uh, zones of control never extend into forested hex, so actually this horse unit um, could not be exerting a zone of control there. So when it came time for there to be a no combat retreat after um, the initial attack, the foraging party could legally have gone there. So they would not have been captured. Secondly, um, the designer states that the um, if the result, regardless of, uh, of the retreat and whether it's legal or not, um, the if the result of this first attack is no combat, um, that automatically means that some of this foraging party managed to escape and get down to the British camp. Therefore, the British should have had um, initiative on turn three. Um, we're gonna say that uh, we're gonna say that for this particular playthrough, the the uh, foraging party didn't manage to get back in time before the uh, Patriots rushed down the road. So um, we'll continue to play on, but I just wanted to uh, point that out before anyone else spots it. Legal retreat hex, and technically, I guess the foraging party would still be in this particular situation. But I'm going to take them off the map and just, you know, say that they were are are not effective anymore, given how they had to disperse. So a pretty big tactical blunder by the Patriots, fresh off of their capture of the uh, sweet potato hunting foragers. They flew up this road to see if they could take the British by surprise. However, we've got some trained military professionals in the British camp, and um, they saw the approaching uh, Patriots. They broke camp really quickly. They formed this defensive posture. Um, between the tree line and the camp, and um, there was a uh, American stack here that got essentially all three fronts, uh, frontal uh, approaches to him uh, was attacked very swiftly by these British regulars, these military professionals. And um, they did a loss to Light Horse Harry Lee's uh, Continental Infantry, uh, so that unit was eliminated, and this uh, South Carolina unit had to fall back. Um, and now they've taken up a position on this road to sort of block the approach to the camp. Meanwhile, they've got a flank, um, sort of a, a strung out wing here that's going to attempt to come around and really disorganize the Americans who are uh, badly out of position uh, for this, especially if they lose momentum on the next uh, on the next uh, uh, turn, the British are going to get to go first. Now, there is something about this game that I did want to show you here, and that is... When the British attacked the, this hex here with these three stacks, um, they rolled a nine on the max uh, column uh, on, on the combat results table. That would have been a two-step loss to the Americans. Um, nine plus their modifier of three, ultimately, is what it turned out to be. Um, even as the Americans tried to withdraw, would have been a two-step loss to the Americans. That would have been pretty devastating. Um, so what the Americans did, they start the scenario with one of these momentum shits, and you get these for a number of different reasons. 
um, in the game based on how the combats turn out and so forth. But they had one to start the game. And so they decided to use their momentum shit uh, in combat uh, to have the British re-roll their die. Um, so instead of being a nine roll, the British actually ended up rolling a four, which converted into a seven, which is only one step loss. So um, the the infantry, the Continental Infantry was still eliminated, but the South Carolina uh, Regiment was able to make a morale check. They failed that, which meant they had to fall back one um, and join up with, I think there's some cavalry under here. Yeah, uh, that's Harry Lee's cavalry who got outran by the infantry. Um, so this momentum shit is gone. And uh, the Americans do not have that anymore, so um, they will have to earn it back uh, via combat. However, um, I believe that there are some morale adjustments here for the eliminated American unit. So, um, yes, the, the British uh, army earns a morale, and the American army loses a morale because of this eliminated Continental Light Infantry unit. Um, so that's a, you know, uh, obviously the Americans don't want to get that lower. Once it gets into this range here, um, that means unit morale is actually, uh, the, the unit morale on counters is actually reduced by one and they don't get a bonus on their initiative roll. So, um, there's kind of some interlocking, um, morale stuff that happens both on the map and also when you determine first player. So, uh, you know, probably not the best start to the game for the Patriots losing that unit outright to a, a really heavy British assault. And, you know, as you look at some of these units, you've got, um, you know, a 3-4 down here. There's actually a 4-4 four, four under this leader who's going to be really tough. So the Americans really got to get set up um, and focus their fire. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to break through this line. The other sort of consideration now for the British is that the uh, Swamp Fox and the South Carolina Militia um, have come down from the north, and they are going to be crossing the Santee River on this turn. Swamp Fox himself is probably going to try and cross, not at the ferry, because then he'll be up on this plateau, He'll be able to get into these woods and he'll be able to take shots at some of the uh, end positions of the British flank. So the British are going to have to probably respond to this um, and they have to be careful because if they don't, uh, there's a free run at both the Plantation House and the Victory Hex uh, down here. The second Royal Highlanders are stationed. So um, and that's a rifle unit. He's going to be able to do range combat, which is sort of an additional combat phase before close combat. So it's something the British are going to have to worry about this turn. Hampton has moved up uh, to the front to support uh, the units from South Carolina against these uh, British regulars. This light infantry unit in particular is really good morale. Um, they were one-to-one -one on the combat column. Uh, the uh, attackers decided to go full frontal assault at the command of Hampton. The British um, decided to just skirmish lightly, and that was a benefit to the attacker. That gave them the DRM they needed, and when they rolled a 9 on their D10 on the one-to-one -one column, they did one step loss to the British and earned a momentum shit for it. So a really powerful attack thanks to Hampton marching up, getting the units in order, and firing a volley um, straight ahead. This lead unit takes a step loss, and now we have to check to see if this unit who's with him stands or retreats, and that is done with a morale check. So um, we look at the unit, he's got a plus one, there's no army unit uh, morale modifiers right now, and we roll the d10. If we get five or more, the unit stands. If we get less than that, the unit retreats one hex. That is a zero plus one is one. So that means this unit was scared off by uh, by the volley and he's got to retreat. He's going to go ahead and retreat under March Banks up here because that's a pretty powerful stack. And uh, this unit now is stuck, kind of caught out um, with the Americans moving in. So uh, fortunes have changed very quickly here and it's going to be the British turn and they're going to have uh, some things that they need to figure out. The American cavalry has swung around to the right here and they're now threatening the camp. So uh, the British are going to have to sort of reorganize their lines and kind of adjust to this new positioning um, as well as the, um, the uh, militia coming from the north. Serious firefights breaking out here in the 11 a.m. turn. The British got a sort of double activation. They uh, ended the, the 10 a.m. turn uh, getting to move and fight and then won the initiative roll on turn five, which is 11 a.m. and uh, just a lot of activity happening. The um, Continental um, Cavalry units here have been driven off by this pair of uh, Tory, um, Tory units who, who came out from the camp, drove off the cavalry in a first sort of assault without any losses, and then the cavalry decided that they were going to withdraw from this attack, um, which, uh, you know, could be, uh, could be good or bad. I think the, the Tories are happy that they've pushed them away from the camp behind all these woods. The downside is that now they can just swing around the rear, and um, these Tories are now out of position in terms of the main engagement, which is happening up here. 
on that note, um, we've got uh, under all these pin markers, we've got a firefight that's been happening uh, back and forth. Uh, there's a there's a British regular under here, plus some Tories, uh, including a rifle unit uh, and a leader in here firing on this um, uh, Patriot uh, Continental Militia unit in these uh, light woods here. Um, they've been, you know, firing volleys back and forth for the last hour. They're about to have another combat, uh, forced combat because of these pin markers. But more significantly, this uh, Continental Artillery Unit has just been uh, eagle-eyed um, in terms of what it's been doing. Um, its first defensive barrage was against this big uh, British 4-4 Irish Buffs unit. Um, it disordered that unit who had to fall back to the camp to try and reorder. He failed his rally roll. So he's going to be out of action for another turn at least. And then um, on this turn, um, the uh, artillery unit struck um, struck a critical hit here against the 64th, um, flipping them over and reducing their strength. And now they're going to be forced to attack uh, Hampton stack here um, at, at bad odds from these woods. But um, the most important thing that happened is that that artillery barrage actually killed Marchbanks who um, is a uh, British, the British uh, leader, the British commander uh, at this, well, sub-commander in this particular battle. Um, he actually did die historically, um, and he was buried on the battlefield uh, from uh, wounds that he suffered. So uh, playing out historically here, um, the artillery uh, barrage just absolutely uh, decimated the 64th and March Banks, who's apparently uh, in there with them commanding forces. So he's going to be removed from the game and destroyed. That's going to have some morale penalties that I will calculate here in a moment for the British and, and not very good ones. Uh, and certainly the Americans now feeling emboldened to um, push through here to the camp, where it's, which is very lightly defended. Up in the north, uh, some uh, Tory uh, cavalry uh, and the 2nd Royal Highlanders moved to respond to this militia rifle unit. Um, there was an inconclusive skirmish, and the rifle unit was pushed back across this little gully ravine um, on top of this plateau, which is not where the British wanted him. Um, and so now they're going to have to chase him down before he can come in down behind and put fire on uh, some of these Tory units. Um, and the uh, Americans are going get to get to go second in this turn, which could be the decisive uh, swift move that they need to end this pretty quickly. So we'll see how it plays out. But right now, the British reeling uh, from just some top-notch uh, Continental artillerymen uh, pinpoint strikes. Well, the British have some real big problems at, the, <laughs> at around noon today. Um, just taking absolutely heavy losses. Uh, you can see most of the regulars are either killed or captured, as happened this turn. This unit got completely surrounded, caught out, and the uh, Green's, Green's forces just laid the smack down on him. Uh, the only real good thing going for them is that they managed to capture Gaines' artillery, the artillery that had been so effectively bombarding. And that has resulted in sort of a collapse of the British position, where basically there are no more Redcoats, um, well officially Redcoats, uh, anywhere uh, near the camp. We've got a broken uh, line all the way up in front of the camp. There's no one standing in the way. The um, Continentals, under Green's leadership, have a free run. And uh, the British really needed to win initiative for the noon turn. Unfortunately, they didn't. And so now the Continentals are going to be able to sweep through Split the army in two, grab some of these camp hexes, and potentially even take the victory point hex. Um, I will definitely tell you that I am not the greatest player at this system since I'm rediscovering it for the first time, but uh, certainly everything that has gone wrong or could go wrong has gone wrong for the British here. Um, not helped by the fact that they so aggressively moved forward to uh, challenge the um, American uh, forces while they were in column, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but as soon as Green brought up some of the regulars, these Continental regulars, uh, the overpowering force of those guns has has been hard to deal with. So um, the Americans are going to get a turn. Um, the British are going to have to figure out some sort of defense here. There's still a pretty powerful artillery battery in this hex along with this militia, and there is still um, another red coat here and a uh, disordered red coat here, although he's in real danger of getting overrun here. And the Americans have three momentum chits on their side based on some of the great rolls they've been making. Um, so it's looking like uh, the British are going to fall apart pretty quick. Um, they're going to have to reorganize and uh, hopefully put up some resistance of some kind to keep the game going. The uh, British have been able to sort of regroup and mount a bit of a counterattack here. Um, a couple of Continental units made it into the first couple of camp hexes. They both became disordered as they began looting the camp hexes, allowing the British time to come and respond. The British uh, eliminated the North Carolina militia unit here that was busy rifling through uh, tents. Um, and took them out, and that actually pushed the British morale up into the middle zone, as you can see over here, which actually takes away one of their morale penalties. And uh, and then um, the there was an attack made by um, Stuart, who 
uh, really only has a small sort of uh, gear. Well, he's under artillery now, but he had a small garrison unit here that attacked against these um, disordered looting um, uh, state units of the Continentals. Uh, didn't go well, and that caused a, a disruption to the attacking units. They had to retreat, so now this in danger. Coffin was able to get behind and um, and surround these units. So it's gonna be kind of down to the wire uh, to see who, who who's gonna win this little engagement here. Now, um, there's a couple of things about to happen. Oh, and then I should also mention um, these uh, prevent or these uh, Tories managed to, again, drive off these cavalry who are happy to just kind of um, move back and uh, not really have anything dangerous happen. And now sort of uh, greens, continentals can come in and get behind these guys and, and do something potentially to them. Um, so there's a couple important things about to happen as we enter the 1 p.m. turn. The first is uh, random reinforcements uh, that the British may or may not get. So uh, when you're playing this face-to-face, -face, these two units could come in on turn 7. Um, and before the game starts, uh, you have to uh, write down on a piece of paper, if you're the British player, um, are, are, you know, are they going to come in or are they not going to come in? I don't believe... Um, so if they do come in, army the the British get do uh, lose morale because they've had to use these units. Now historically, these units didn't make it to the battle; they were too late. But there's a chance here, and because obviously I'm playing solo, um, I couldn't I didn't want to make that decision knowing in advance. So I figured we'd do it by die roll. And so we're gonna roll here to see whether or not these uh, units do enter the battlefield this turn, um, this upcoming turn. Um, and so we're gonna say even even roll they uh, they come in, and odd roll they uh, don't make it. And we roll, and it's an even roll, so they are going to come in this turn. I'm just going to put them over here as a reminder. They can come in uh, either down here or up here, and it looks like they probably want to come in down here. So just to, to remember that. Um, and then the next thing that happens here is the initiative roll. And the initiative roll is going to be really important here. If the British get it, they could potentially um, shore up their defense, and we could still have a game of it. Um, but if they don't, then the Continentals, I think, are going to have their way with them. So let's see what happens there. The Continentals win the initiative, so uh, Green is going to get to go first, and I think this may be uh, sort of the end days of uh, the British position at the Wantoot Plantation at Utah Springs. And that is going to be all she wrote. The British uh, side absolutely broken, demoralized, the army fleeing Utah Springs in defeat. As Nathaniel Green successfully uh, captures the Wantoot Plantation from the British, and on the final turn, which was the uh, 1 p.m. hour, the 1 p.m. turn, uh, the uh, regulars from Virginia and some of the militia from South Carolina drove off uh, these Tory units through the camp, and Nathaniel Green himself marched straight up the road, um, attacked and defeated uh, Coffin and his Charlton Hussars, uh, captured them both. Um, in, in an attack, even despite the fact that these Mar the Maryland Brigade that he was commanding uh, took um, some rifle fire uh, and had to retreat from before the attack. So ultimately, uh, this is what, uh, you know, capturing Coffin and these Hussars is ultimately what put the Americans over the top <clears throat> and won them the battle. Um, as you can see, uh, these reinforcements probably would not have made a difference had we got to the British half of the turn. Most of the, the British army is just completely broken um, and... Um, you know, demoralized. Uh, and so uh, Green faring better here than he did historically, where the British fought him basically to uh, a, a marginal defeat or a draw, I guess, if depending on how you want to look at the way that Battle of Utah Springs came out. Um, but all in all, uh, great patriot. Despite despite some um, ill-advised sort of column march up this road into danger, the patriots got it together and uh, managed to sweep the British from the field. So that's Utah Springs. Um, you know, I had so much fun playing this. It was uh, short, sweet, uh, very enjoyable. Uh, that I think I'm gonna um, fire up Guilford Courthouse uh, and and play that, which is another small scenario. Um, but before I do that, just uh, you know, revisiting this system is really a joy. Um, this the game plays very swiftly. Um, there's not a lot of, t uh, of rules. Uh, I think, you know, the thing that takes probably the most time is resolving a combat and just figuring out the DRMs, which, you know, the core of the combat here is DRM based. Um, even at one to one odds, there are a lot of attacks that were at one to one odds or, or three to two odds that if you can get uh, enough DRMs, you can actually um, do pretty well. I know that some of the criticisms of this of this system say that it's too bloody, uh, potentially. As you can see, we had a bunch of eliminated units in the span of a couple hours. Um, you know, it doesn't really bother me. I, as far as a 
uh, simulation of 18th century warfare, if I wanted sort of uh, a complete gritty, you know, really highly detailed simulation, I could go play um, Battles of the Age of Reason by Clash of Arms. But this is, uh, this is you know, still uh, gives you a flavor of the period. It still, um, you know, gives you some nice uh, maneuver and combat and strategic thinking elements. And yeah, it may be a little bloody given, you know, casualties at the time, but you're still, you know, having to do things like uh, get your positioning right, you know, engage when it's optimal for you and those swings back and forth with the momentum. And, you know, some turns can be good, some turns can be bad. Really, there's a, there's a really nice um, uh, flow to this game. And it's super playable. Uh, this is this is a really good sort of intro level hex encounter game. If someone's interested in the American Revolution, um, you know, I would say maybe Commands and Colors Tricorn would be sort of the lowest level. This would be a step up from that. Um, but I could definitely see someone coming from com co Commands and Colors to this system and actually really enjoying themselves. Um, and I think one of the things I actually really enjoyed about this particular playthrough is this solo chart. Um, it added some unpredictability to the battle and it took some decisions out of my hands um, that made it really interesting to resolve. I, I like when I'm playing solo to have um, a story develop and something that I wasn't expecting to happen. And, you know, a couple times during this battle, we had units, um, you know, who were, you know, maybe would have withdrawn, you know, if they were in the withdrawal plausible, but they stood, they stood and fought and, um, you know, ended up winning a, a combat that maybe as I had a player had chosen that maybe I as a player had, would have chosen withdraw and had them not try and fight the combat. So it was interesting. This adds a really nice element to the, this system. And I think this is sort of a really uh, key part to playing this solo. I think if you're going to play solo, you definitely want to use this. Highly recommend this. Um, you know, it just added enough sort of fog of war to the proceedings that it was kind of, it was kind of fun to, to see it play out. Um, other than that, component quality, beautiful. You know, GMT has really upped their component quality in the last couple of years. And uh, this is one of those sort of deluxe printings, really thick counters. I don't need to trim these. I, I never usually do trim the thick uh, brown core GMT ones because they pop out of the sprue really nicely, not really any dog ears. Uh, maps are gorgeous. Um, you know, the player aid is extremely usable. It's only, you know, one page front and back. And it's got every rule you need for Utah Springs and Guilford. As you can see, so really, you know, any special leader um, casualties, what happens to them, any DRMs you might need specific for this scenario with, with the terrain that's in this scenario. Um, so really nicely done, just very easy to use, very easy to play. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a nice <laughs> breath of fresh air to come from uh, Fornovo 1495, which I struggled with a lot, to something that was just really smooth, um, breezy, uh, and, and enjoyable. So... If you've ever been looking at this system, you know, there's what, there's nine volumes in this system now. So the, the tri pack, um, comes with the first three, you get hours and hours of gameplay out of this. You know, you can, I could set this scenario up again for the historical setup. Uh, and, um, you know, it might play out differently than here. Even this scenario would play out differently if I played it again. But bigger battles like Saratoga have actually two, they have the first and second day of Saratoga. Um, you know, you've got sort of variants on that. And then you've got all the other games in the series that haven't been in the tri-pack um, that you can still probably find. Monmouth, I know, is really well, highly regarded as being very balanced. Um, but there's other ones. Battle of Rhode Island came out a couple of years ago. That's the newest one. Um, and then they've got some really, you know, each one of the games, it has like really different interesting scenarios. I know that the Pensacola game is a siege game, not a battle game. Um, and then Newtown has cards in it. Some of the games have cards that, you know, you use cards to help you uh, card assisted uh, the situation on the map. So there's a lot of variety in the series and you really can't go wrong with any of them, I would think. But the tri-pack certainly is the best value for money. And I do know, um, I will close here by saying, I do know that uh, GMT teased that there's going to be some new addition to the Battles of the American Revolution series uh, in the next uh, next month's P500. So I don't know if that's going to be another tri-pack with the next three games, which I believe is Savannah, which has been long out of print. So I think the next three would be Savannah, Monmouth, and number six, which I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, maybe Newtown? Anywho, that would be cool. Or a new one. Volume 10 would be great as well. I think, you know, I, I think we're coming up to sort of the limit of what the number of sort of engagements of a large enough size that this system could sort of, um, you know, play them uh, adequately. But, uh, you know, I'm always down for more of this system. I've enjoyed it every time I've played it. So there you go. Uh, Battles of the American Revolution, Utah Springs. Um, I'm next video is probably going to be set up on uh, Guilford Courthouse and uh, we'll run through that. And so if you enjoyed this, more coming.